Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 74 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. My guest today is Brian Mora. Brian served as an intelligence officer in the U.S. Air Force and Air Force Reserve for a total of 15 years before moving into the aerospace and defense industry, where he worked for many more years managing various intelligence programs. He retired as a senior vice president for Northrop Grumman at the end of 2016 and turned his attention to writing. In particular, he wrote about a little known but pivotal event which took place in 1983 and brought the world to the brink of nuclear war. I invited Brian onto the podcast after learning of his new book, The Able Archers, which is based not only on real life events, but which he was directly involved in as a young intelligence officer. If you want to read it yourself, you can download a free PDF of the introduction and first chapter of the able archers after you finish listening to this episode just click the link in the show notes on whatever podcast platform you're listening on now but before we get into that i want to say a big thank you to everyone listening who is also supporting me on patreon including max e and andy h your monthly contributions there help me keep this podcast going week in and week out as a way of thanking my patrons i offer a lot of great freebies and promotions including free and discounted books and products from the spycraft 101 store Patrons also get exclusive access to long-form articles of mine that aren't available anywhere else. If you haven't signed up for my Patreon yet, but you want to, just click the link in the show notes on whatever podcast platform you're listening to right now. Brian, thank you for taking the time to speak to me today. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much for the uh, chance to chat with you, Justin. Yeah, absolutely. I've been looking forward to this. This episode, in fact, is unique because this is the first time that I've discussed a book which was a novelization of true events as opposed to a biography. But I thought that, quite frankly, this was the perfect novel to start with, as much of it is based on your own firsthand experiences during the Cold War. Yeah, well, I, I think so, too. So I again, <laughs> yeah. appreciate it, pre appreciate the opportunity to be here with your listeners. Absolutely. Absolutely. I know that's why you wrote it in the first place. But what is it, Brian, that made you decide to write it as a novelization rather than as a pure biography? for example, of the of your time in the 1983 Soviet nuclear war scare? Well, I, I think that I wanted to both educate and entertain with this book, and I, I felt that the best way of doing that was a dramatization of the real events, particularly because I had my own personal insight that I could bring to the table as a participant in some of the some of the events. So I, I wanted to make it an exciting yet educational experience for the reader. And I also wanted to personalize the players in this very dramatic series of events and, and make them human and maybe connect with people a little bit differently than you can with a nonfiction work. You know, that makes perfect sense. And now that I, I think about it, that was a huge gateway for me into a lot of this kind of history, because when I was much younger, I was not reading biographies, you know, in my teens and early 20s and that sort of thing. That wasn't really what I was looking for, but I was reading Tom Clancy, Larry Bond, Harold Coyle, um, mm -hmm. those kind of authors. And I mean, they had a huge influence on what I'm doing these days, as a matter of fact. So if you can reach somebody in the way that they were able to reach me years ago, then that's, you know, that's going to be fantastic. And I think that's a great thing to strive for. Yeah, I, I, well, thank you. I agree entirely. And one of the best compliments I've gotten from a number of readers of the Able Archers is that it reminds them of Tom Clancy at his best. And, and one of the approaches I took was to include detail, to include a sense of how intelligence operations actually unfold, but at the same time, not make it so technical that I would turn off the layman. I didn't want this book just to be for people who spent their careers in the business. I wanted it to, to reach a wide audience, both in terms of demographics, age, et cetera. 
and also in terms of life experience. Good. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, honestly. And I, ho I certainly hope it does reach that wider audience because, you know, I tend to stick with books in a certain niche. And I know that a lot of them, you know, they might have a big impact within that niche, but that's still a pretty small niche, quite frankly. So I hope that you're able to kind of break out of the bounds of that. And a novelization of this story is really the, the perfect way to do that, I think. Yeah, well, that's my intent. And, and I, I know my publisher shares that hope. <laughs> so. but, uh, yeah, I'm sure. Did. <laughs> Although it is a novelization, like we just said, of course, did you still have to run this book by the U.S. government because some of it was based on your own experiences? Or are you able to publish anything because it is ultimately fiction? I did run this and subsequent manuscripts that I've written, and we can touch on those in a moment. But yes, I, the Able Archers had to be approved through an office of pre-publication review, which is located in the Pentagon. And that's a central clearinghouse, not only for the Department of Defense, but also for the entire intelligence community. So the Able Archers went through that rigorous review process. It took, the Able Archers, I think, took about four and a half months to get cleared. And that was pre-COVID. Mm. And since COVID hit, books take much longer than that. In fact, my my last book, which is book number four in the series, was just approved in July of this of this year, and that took nearly 12 months. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, you're still working way ahead though. That's really good. It sounds like you were just churning through your, your manuscripts there even before this one was published. And that sounds like a strategy that's serving you really well with these unexpected delays. Yes, it it turned out to be fortuitous. I really going into this didn't have any idea how long the clearance process would take. But as I said, it's taken longer once COVID hit and folks weren't able to go into the office and and, and that sort of thing. But I, hmm. I will give a shout out to the guys in this office, which is in the office of the Secretary of Defense. Very professional, terrific people, very willing to work with me and, and, and try to clarify things that, that generated questions from various parts of the government. So they're a terrific group of people. Good, good. So I have to ask, do they do they work in a sense like editors? Do they, you know, for example, do they give you feedback like, hey, can you alter this part? Or do they just say, you know, like page four, paragraph two has to be struck in its entirety or something like that? It's a bit of both. The last book, actually the Able Archers, since we're focused on that today, there were no redactions for hmm. the Able Archers, and which surprised me and and pleasantly surprised me. No redactions and no requests for any editorial changes. Last book, the last manuscript, which I mentioned I just got approved in July, had 85 requests for redaction. Well, not they're not requests, actually. <laughs> they're, <laughs> <laughs> they're directives for redactions. And also, in some cases, they suggested editorial comments. They they made editorial comments suggesting this is what we'd like you to say. So, okay, but but okay. generally it's just a redaction. Generally, okay. they just say, take this out. I see. So can a redaction in these cases, can that be like a single, like a name or something like that? Or is it oftentimes like sentences, paragraphs, pages? Well, in my case, it's just been place names and in some instances, names of individuals and even names of organizations. Ah. that they've not wanted me to include. And, you know, as a writer, the redactions have not caused me too much heartburn in as much as they really are not material to the story. They're not really material to the book. And I can always find a way of, <laughs> you know, dealing with the redaction in such a way that it doesn't perturb the narrative. Okay, good, good. That's good to know. Well, I'm glad. And now here it is. So that's fantastic. So, yeah, Brian, going back to your own story, what was it that led you to join the Air Force as an intelligence officer to begin with? Well, as a teenager, I wanted to be, I had a desire to either be in the intelligence business or in the foreign service. And in college, I kind of prepared myself academically in that regard. I did study Russian language in university and I was a history major, but nowadays I probably would be considered a Russian studies major. And so that was, I, I was very interested in, as I said, either either the intelligence business or the foreign service. And I, as a senior at 
college, I went through both processes, both with the State Department and with the CIA. And I, I really was very naive. I didn't know much about anything. And, but I, I did have some success with CIA in getting through their process. However, I was told that my particular cadre of people would be delayed going into training because of budget issues and maybe some other issues that I wasn't aware of. But in any event, there was going to be a, a delay. And when I learned that, I asked a couple of kindly CIA officers what they would recommend me to do because I really couldn't stand a delay. I needed to get to work. And they first suggested going to graduate school. And I said, well, that's not really an option for me. I don't have the money. And then they said, well, go into the military, become an intelligence officer. And then in four or five years, come back and see us and it, you'll have no problem. So I hadn't really thought about going into the military up until that point. And I was fortunate enough to get into the Air Force and officer's training school and become an Air Force officer and then went through Air Force intelligence training as well as some three-letter organizations training schools as well. Ah, very good. Very good. So did the did your Russian language and, and cultural studies from school, did those like genuinely assist you in your career or was it something that, you know, they like to see it, but they won't necessarily have you in a position where you can use those skills, you know, that knowledge? Well, I, I did use those skills and that knowledge as an intelligence officer through throughout really, certainly my active duty career. I was at the time of the Able Archers, at the time of the nuclear crisis that that unfolded over the course of several months in the fall of 1983, I was actually chief of intelligence analysis at U.S. Forces Japan. And prior, just immediately prior to be being promoted to being chief of intelligence analysis, I was the head Soviet analyst. So oh, wow. I, yeah, so that was my thing. And then my subsequent assignments, my immediate assignment after Japan was to a special unit, intelligence unit in Washington that was called somewhat nebulously the Soviet Affairs Directorate. So yes, I was, I was considered a Soviet specialist. Good, good, good. That was the perfect thing to major in then, even if you hadn't intended to use it in the Air Force when you were in school. Yeah, I, I often commented to friends that if I planned my career, I couldn't have planned it. I couldn't, it couldn't have, I couldn't have done any better uh, really <laughs> in, in what I ended up doing. Yeah. Good, good. That's fantastic. Again, yeah, it all led you, you know, through many more years and a very successful career from what I've seen. And now here we are talking about your book series as well. So that, based on all of that, so it seems very fortuitous to say the least. Yes. Fortune favors the brave and, and, the, and the, and the prepared, I suppose. So absolutely, I was, I was pretty prepared for the kind of work I did in the air force. Good. So the book of course is called the able archers, like we've mentioned, but it actually covers several separate events, not just the able archer exercise and all right. of these took place over the fall of 1983. And it's really clear, you know, I was, I was not old enough at the time to remember, or understand what was going on there but i mean it sounds to me now the more i read along that just like you say in the book we were getting really really close to, to full-scale nuclear war there even if people didn't realize it so can you talk a little bit about the two of these events that you were involved in i think starting with the uh, kal shootdown yeah the kal shootdown is the event i was the most involved with personally and again i was chief of analysis and we had been in japan and, and just to set the scene for you U.S. Forces Japan headquarters is co-located with 5th Air Force headquarters, and it's in it's at a base called Yokota, which is in the western suburbs of Tokyo. And one of the responsibilities of that function there is to keep safe our intelligence collection aircraft flying throughout the entire theater, so from Alaska all the way down to Vietnam, actually. And we had a command center in our building that was co-located with a big intelligence fusion cell. And the purpose of that, again, was to provide uh, real-time warning to intelligence collection aircraft throughout the entire theater and to get them out of trouble if they came to be in trouble. 
So we were keenly watching not only the Soviet air defense force, but also the North Koreans, the Chinese, and even the Vietnamese. And the even though this was after the Vietnam War, and in the case of the Soviets, beginning in April of 1983, in the Far East, the Soviet air defense forces went on an unprecedented level of alert. And it was precipitated by the US Navy overflying Soviet military facilities in the Kuril Island chain. And the Soviet air defense forces failed to respond to those US Navy overflights. They never got a fighter off the ground. And after that incident, the Soviets complained that we'd violated their airspace and they complained rather vociferously about that. Hmm. Uh, and, and they purged a lot of the leadership in the air defense forces in the Soviet Far East and everybody got the word in the Far East that if you allowed a border violator, an aircraft intruder into Soviet airspace and didn't respond, heads would roll because head, heads did roll there <laughs> in April of 1983. So that was part of the backdrop. And, and my analytical group was, we did a big analysis of what the Soviets were up to because our crews, our, the crews flying our intelligence collection aircraft were alarmed, I think is not too strong a word, at the reactions they were getting from Soviet fighters, Soviet surface-to-air missile systems, and the like throughout the entire Far East. So we were keenly, again, aware of watching, assessing what the, what the Soviets were doing in the months preceding the shootdown of the Korean airliner. Yeah, I'll, I'll bet. I mean, I know that one of the defining moments of the Cold War was an American aircraft being shot down over Soviet territory in 1960 with Francis Gary Powers as the pilot. So for that kind of thing to happen again would, would be undesirable for everyone involved, to put it mildly. Yeah, and the shootdown of the U-2 and Gary Powers is the most famous of those incidents during the Cold War, but there were there were scores of them. We lost very large numbers of intelligence collection aircraft that never never went public until after the Cold War. And these shootdowns were kept in highly classified channels. And the families of the lost crew members were told that they they were lost because of mechanical failures or weather or what have you. And it was only in the I think it was the late 1990s, maybe the mid 90s, that the U.S. government revealed the fact that, no, we actually lost to enemy action a very large number of aircraft over the course of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. So this was yeah, a very I, I, real threat to these, you know, the, the guys, the kids that were in these crews, crewing these, these aircraft, they knew that history. They were cleared mm -hmm. for it. And so this was not, it wasn't theoretical to them <laughs> when Soviet MiG-23s or MiG-25s rolled up alongside them and armed their missiles. It, it was very real to them. Yeah, it's, it's hard for me to imagine how stressful intense that might have much of, must have been, but also a very, very critical, high priority mission for those guys. I, I did have a guest last year, and we talked a lot about those. And if I recall correctly, the number of KIA and MIA was something like over 200, like over 200 pilots and airmen were yeah. killed or went missing. That, that's an astonishing number to cover up, even over a spread out over a period of time. That, that's pretty insane that that went relatively unknown for, for several decades. Were, were any of these shootdowns, to your knowledge, were they happening up into the early 1980s? Because the ones that I have read about, a lot of them were toward the earlier years of the Cold War, and, and we kind of changed up our, our tactics a little bit, you know, in the later years. You're right. They were mostly in the early decades of the Cold War. We lost Intel collection aircraft in the Vietnam War, too, of course. Okay. So our aircraft were frequently, when I even in the early 1980s, were frequently harassed by North Korean fighters. So it was, you're right that those those fatalities and those actual shootdowns tended to happen earlier 
they did happen earlier in the Cold War. But as I mentioned, this entire complex that I worked in was established to prevent those kinds of shoot downs from occurring again. Hmm. So we were much more prepared in the 1980s than we would have been in the 1960s. We had much better intelligence collection. For example, we were able to provide real time warning to aircraft who were in harm's way and get them out of get them out of harm's way. And in fact, I described one of those one such incident in the able archers that occurred a couple of days after the Korean airliner was shot down. Oh, wow. Okay. On that note, the Korean airliner, how exactly did it wind up in, you know, the sites of Soviet air defenses or Soviet fighter aircraft anyway? I mean, it was a, a 747 or something, was it? Wasn't it? Yeah, it, it was a Korean airline 747 civilian flight that originated in at Kennedy at JFK actually, and then stopped in Anchorage to refuel and it was en route to Seoul, South Korea, 269 passengers and crew on board, including 62 Americans, including a U.S. congressman, all, oh of, whom were, all of whom were killed. It, it is also important to note, I think, that the overall context to 1983 and what we were dealing with in the fall of 83 was a hyper paranoia in the Kremlin in terms of their view of Ronald Reagan, their view of Margaret Thatcher, their view of the United States and NATO and as being an aggressive force that wanted to destroy the Soviet Union. And they believed by early 1983 that actually prior to that, but that the United States was probably planning a nuclear first strike on the Soviet Union and was looking for excuses to do so. So one of the interpretations of the Korean Airlines flight in Moscow was, oh, this is a provocation designed to provoke us into conflict, which would then give the United States a reason to launch a nuclear first strike on us. So. Oh. Um, and, and that context was not publicly understood at the time, and it wasn't actually well understood in Washington at the time, but many of us who were Soviet analysts, we understood that context that they, and, and they viewed the Korean Airlines incident as a provocation. I, I mentioned the U.S. Navy overflights of Soviet military facilities in April of 1983. That was another provocation in their minds, and it was. And most very, very importantly, again, in the year 1983, the U.S. NATO would begin deploying a new generation of nuclear missiles in Europe. And they were slated to be deployed by the end of the year, at least initial, initially deployed by the end of 1983, Pershing II ballistic missiles to Germany and ground launch cruise missiles to the United Kingdom. And the Soviets viewed both of those weapon systems as first strike weapons, that hmm. the only reason the U.S. had deployed or was in the process of deploying them was to enable the United States to have the ability to launch a decapitating first strike on the Kremlin. Hmm. So all of, you know, the Korean Airlines incident, as awful as it was, it, it didn't take place in a vacuum. It was part of this entire context of very, very bad relations between the USSR and the United States and an almost complete lack of communication between the two countries, which only got worse after the Korean airliner was shot down. Mm. Sure. So was it ultimately shot down by one of their fighter aircraft? I mean, how did the actual, like, you know, minute by minute of that occur? Yes. Well, the Korean airliner went off course and flew about 200 nautical miles north of its intended course as a result of a navigational error. We we're not precisely sure what that navigational error was, but we know there are a couple of different ways it could have happened. But in any event, it did it did occur, and the aircraft went off course not long after it left Alaskan airspace. It went off course, 
and it overflew uh, the Soviet and Russian peninsula of Kamchatka, and it overflew Petropavlovsk, which is a, a port city at the southern tip of Kamchatka, where the Soviet Union then and the Russian Navy today has a nuclear submarine base. And mm. the Soviets thought, you know, to them, th this can't be an innocent mistake, this aircraft. Why would they fly right over the submarine base? The Soviets attempted to intercept with fighter aircraft, the Korean airliner over Kamchatka and failed. They failed to intercept it, and it continued on across the Sea of Okhotsk, which is the body of water between the Kamchatka Peninsula and Sakhalin Island and the, the Russian mainland. So it, it proceeded across the Sea of Okhotsk unmolested because the Soviets had no way of getting to it. And But as soon as it came close to Sakhalin Island and Soviet radars reacquired it, then the Soviets began launching fighter aircraft to intercept it and attempt to warn it, attempt to bring it down peacefully. And those attempts failed. And as the Korean airliner was about to depart Soviet airspace, a Sukhoi 15 fighter was given target destruct orders and shot the aircraft down. Hmm. My gosh, those poor people. Did the did the pilots mm -hmm. understand the danger that they were in? I mean, I guess we can't ask them after the fact, but do you do you think that they did? That did they understand the warnings from the Soviet air defenses? No, we don't think so. The in fact, the Soviet pilot who shot the Korean airliner down, I have a in the Able Archers, I've got a, a lengthy interview with him in the book, which is based on real interviews that he gave. And he one of the things he said in one of his real interviews was that his aircraft was loaded with armor penetrating rounds. So they were not the sort of rounds that would be visible at night. This is all happening at night in the early morning hours of the 1st of September, 1983. So he did fire warning shots, but he himself said in an interview, there's no way they would have been, they, it, it would have been a miracle had they, they been able to see them from the cockpit. Mm, and he had, he had no way of communicating with the cockpit. He was left, or the Soviets felt they were left with no choice but to shoot it down since it was about to leave their airspace. Mm -hmm. Wow, just a terrible situation all around, the miscommunication and the necessity that the Soviets feel to not let something happen on their watch again. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That is true. Yeah. Yeah. That context is important. And in fact, I gave a briefing that summer in July of 1983 to the commander in chief of Pacific Command, four star Admiral Crow, who later became chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And at the conclusion of my briefing, which was all about the Soviet air defense situation in the Far East and the danger to our air crews, he asked me, would they shoot down a, a a civilian air, airliner. And I told him, honestly, you know, we hadn't really considered that possibility because why would an airliner be in their airspace? But I told him, you know, if, if it's a border violator and they can't contact it, then I think all bets are off. Hmm. I think, I think wow. there's, they probably will, would shoot it down because of what happened in April of that year and, and what happened to officers who didn't take action. Yeah, they've, they've certainly got a huge incentive to not let something like that happen again. So once the actual shoot down occurs, how quickly did the Soviets realize that it really was just a, a passenger airliner? Well, the morning of the shoot down, when the major, the Soviet Air Defense Forces major who did the shoot down was debriefed, he indicated to his superiors that he thought it was a 747 and that he saw two rows of, of windows. And he was pressed on that and said, well, because the Soviets thought it was an RC-135, US intelligence collection, Air Force Intel collection plane. And RC-135s are built on Boeing 707 airframes, not 747s. Mm, okay. And so they thought, oh, you made a mistake. It's, you know, it, there couldn't have been two rows of, portholes because 707s don't have them. 
And he said, well, I'm just telling you what I saw. <laughs> so <laughs> they, you know, they knew something was amiss, I think, that morning. But to this day, I, I think, I can't say with certainty, but I would surmise that most, there are a lot of people in the Kremlin, even today, who believe that this was a U.S. intelligence collection flight. Wow. And that maybe it was a Korean airliner or maybe the crew didn't even know that they were being used, but they were being, you know, the, that the U.S. had was trying to trick the Soviets again into a, a, a provocation that could give the United States a rationale to launch a nuclear first strike. That that was it's hard to imagine, you know, in our minds that they thought that way, but they definitely did. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they that's something that we can imagine our own adversaries doing, but that we would never do. And probably they've kind of felt the same way or possibly they felt kind of the same way because, you know, people have been used as as human shields in many conflicts mm -hmm. over the years. So maybe they thought this is the most provocative thing the U.S. could do to us, dare us to shoot down this passenger airliner, you know, knowing or thinking there might be civilians aboard. So I don't think we ever would consider doing that. But, you know, they saw us very differently than we see ourselves. Yes. Yes. And and this was, again, for listeners, part of the context of 1983, which I believe was the most dangerous year of the Cold War. And some historians have called the most dangerous year in human history. Part of the context was Ronald Reagan's speech making, which in March of 1983, he gave two barn burners <laughs> speeches. Um, and, and the first one, was has become known in history as his evil empire speech in which he called the soviet union the focus of evil in the modern world and an evil empire and then just a couple of weeks after that speech he gave a, another a national address on primetime tv revealing the existence of the strategic defense initiative which the press dubbed star wars and the, the both of those speeches were greeted with near hysteria in the Kremlin. And the second speech, the Star Wars speech, seemed to them particularly provocative because what Reagan was talking about was creating a defensive shield around the United States and its allies that would essentially negate the Soviet nuclear threat. And so in their minds, what that, what that equated to was a, an architecture that would enable the United States to conduct a nuclear first strike and then sit back with impunity and defeat the Soviet counterstrike. So the the whole zeitgeist of the of the time, the whole ecosystem of relations was was so fraught that it's hard for people, it's hard for us to imagine today. Yeah, yeah, it, it certainly is. And we were both, I mean, we had so many different types of clandestine activities going on at that time that it's easy to imagine the worst case scenario from all of this stuff. And I guess that, you know, Americans, we like to think that, okay, well, at least we'll be safe from nuclear annihilation right? instead of thinking that that does give us the opportunity for a first strike, which I'm sure crossed the minds of a number of people in the Pentagon and in you know the air force strategic command and that sort of thing at that time even if it wasn't what we ultimately would have done but yeah i, I can see how the colonel would be deeply concerned about that and see things totally differently than we see them ourselves yes they did and and the same is true the you know the korean airline shoot down they viewed it through a completely different prism than we did i, I mentioned began to mention earlier that in the immediate aftermath of the korean airline shoot down there was a massive search and rescue effort conducted by the Soviet Air Force and Navy in the Tatar Strait, which is where that's a body of water where the plane went down between Sakhalin Island and, and the, the Siberian mainland. And the United States also sent search and rescue aircraft and, and eventually ships up there. And it, it's then, it was two days after the shoot down of the Korean airliner when a U.S. Navy intelligence collection plane, an EP-3, was nearly shot down by two Soviet MiG-23s. And the Soviets wrongly believed that the EP-3 had violated their border, that it was flying in their airspace, 
and they weren't going to tolerate that. And they sent two MiG 23s to shoot it down. Wow. And, and we, I, I mentioned the function that I was chief of analysis in. So we warned the EP3 because we intercepted the Soviet communications ordering the MiGs to shoot it down. And we immediately alerted the EP3 crew and they took evasive action and got out of there. And the evasive action for them was essentially to dive for the wave tops from, they would be flying at about 25,000 feet and they just dove down to the wave tops to try to get away from the MiGs. And simultaneously, our commander in the command post sent four, a flight of four US Air Force F-15s to go intercept the MiG-23s. And this is, I describe all this in the, in the Able Archers. It was a, a frightening situation. Fortunately for the world, the EP-3 pilot was able to maneuver and evade through the wave tops and, and got the EP-3 safely back to Japanese airspace. And our commander then ordered the F-15s, which by then had intercepted the big 23s to um, break off the intercept and go back to their patrol point. My gosh, I can see. So you were present for all of this at that time. Were you, were you seeing yes. all of this essentially in real time? Yes. 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 Did mm -hmm. you have a sense at that time that things were kind of like spiraling out of control or was this like a, like chess moves at the, not the shoot down of the KLA, KAL, of course, but the MiG 23s and the, and the response from the U S were these normal moves during those times, or was this like a really quickly overboiling situation? It was the latter. And in fact, when our general Charles Donnelly was the commander of us forces, Japan, when he ordered the F 15s to go back to their patrol point, their cap point, combat air patrol point, one of the general officers who was present took exception to his decision <laughs> and indicated that we had every right to shoot the MiG-23s down. And General Donnelly's response was, I don't think I'll start World War III this afternoon. Oh, wow. So, I mean, it, everybody knew, I think we all knew the stakes and we knew that uh, things could rapidly get out of control. And not only did we have a lot of aircraft flying in close proximity with each other, but both the Soviet Navy and the U.S. Navy had lots of Navy ships in very close proximity with each other. And there were several near collisions and it was it was messy and it could have it could have turned into a shooting war. Mm. Yeah, that's that was incredibly smart of him to de-escalate because I know that that in some ways that kind of goes against military mindset and, and training and all that to back down from an adversary, but it certainly sounds like that was absolutely the right move in this case. Yeah, and I could tell, I was, I was just a few feet away from General Donnelly when he made the decision and it, there was never any hesitation. He knew exactly the right thing to do. He, wow. he, he was a cool customer and he was one of those guys that you want in command during a crisis. Good, good. Yeah, he sounds like the right man in the right time and the right place. Yes, very much so. So was there any other major repercussions from this shoot down besides the, the tensions rising? I mean, were there any diplomatic moves made or, or anything like that? Or were things just kind of steadily, temperature steadily rising? Well, there were, on the diplomatic front, things really went haywire. The U.S. State Department and the Soviet Foreign Ministry essentially stopped communicating with each other after trading rather heavily barbed comments back and forth. There was no communication between the White House and the Kremlin. The famous hotline that was set up during the Kennedy administration was not used. There was just a, an absence of communication, except through the media, except through speeches that each side was making. Secretary of State George Schultz famously had his Adelaide Stevenson moment, um, getting back, referencing the <laughs> Cuban Missile Crisis, where George Schultz went into the UN Security Council and played the intercepted tapes of the Soviet pilot shooting down the Korean airliner and essentially 
you know, calling the Russians barbarians and criminals and and so on and so forth. Mm. And the, the Soviet ambassador stormed out of the meeting and things were really heated. I myself briefed Secretary of Defense Casper Weinberger on the shoot down and on the build up to it. He came through Tokyo a few days after the shoot down to meet with the Japanese prime minister. And then also to, he went to Seoul, Korea to meet with the president of South Korea. And I briefed him at the CIA station in the embassy in downtown Tokyo. Interestingly, uh, he had with him his young military assistant, Brigadier General Colin Powell. So Powell was there. But anyway, I gave my briefing and, and Secretary Weinberger didn't agree with my conclusion, which was essentially the Soviets on the night of the shoot down, the Soviets were on a hair trigger because of earlier events in the year and they were confused. We probably don't have time to get into all the reasons for their confusion, but they were very, very confused that night about what they were dealing with. And they didn't, my conclusion was they did not intentionally shoot down a civilian airliner and kill people with murderous intent. That was not what happened that night. Anyway, the secretary took extreme exception to my analysis, <laughs> shall we say, and <laughs> shut me down. But he was he was very illustrative of the viewpoint throughout the administration and throughout official Washington over this incident. And and it precipitated then a heightening of tension, a lack of communication that played out through the following months leading up to the Able Archer exercise. Wow. You know, this is amazing. This whole time we've been talking about only one of the three major events that occurred then. And with everything that's already happened, I'm, I'm amazed that we're all still here and survived 1983 to talk about it. Yeah, I was, I have to say, I mean, I was, I was a pretty young guy at the time and I was really shaken by the whole the whole experience. And I was, I was, I, I would say somewhat disappointed in the way that our own government handled it. And President Reagan gave a speech just a few days after the shoot down, which he called the Korean airline massacre speech. Oh, wow. And, and it, again, it was a nationally televised primetime event, which in those days meant something. And so we were really raising the temperature in ways that I didn't, even as a young guy, I didn't think was healthy. And, and it, it really, again, triggered the series of events that led up to a near catastrophe during the Able Archer exercise. Mm -hmm. So besides all of this that we've just discussed, there's another event. And as far as I know, none of us even realized this happened until just a few years ago, right? Like 30, 35 years approximately after it occurred, but that was the false alarm that occurred with the Soviet missile defenses. Can you talk about that a little bit as well? Has this podcast given you a renewed interest in the history of the Cold War? Do you want to share that interest with others? Well, now there's a fun and interactive way to introduce your family and friends to the topic. I'm talking about 15-Minute Cold War, a new strategy-based card game for up to four players. As one of the great powers during the Cold War, used your armed forces to attack opponents while defending yourself with military, scientific, and economic assets. There are also wild cards based on real events and people to keep things interesting. For example, how will Oleg Penkovsky weaken one side or strengthen another? Players don't have to know any history to start playing, just learn the color codes and point values of each card. My eight-year-old daughter understood the game mechanics within a few minutes and has already won two rounds against her mom and I. There's also an expansion edition available for game nights of up to eight players. Find it at 15mincoldwar.com. That's 15mincoldwar.com. And make sure to follow at 15minutecoldwar on Instagram. Yes, the man who saved the world incident, the Lieutenant Colonel Stanislav Petrov incident, which occurred just a few weeks after the Korean airline shoot down. So the Korean airline shoot down occurs on the 1st of September, 1983. This event took place, Petrov event took place over the night of the 26th, 27th of September. He was an 
Soviet Air Defense Forces officer. He was assigned to the National Missile Defense Center of the Soviet Union, which was located about, a, about 60 miles south of Moscow. He was not typically a watch officer, although he was on watch duty the night that this event occurred. He, his, his day job, so to speak, was he was chief of algorithm development for processing the signals that came from satellites and from other sensor systems. So he was more of a scientist engineer kind of officer, but he had intimate knowledge of their of the sensors on their missile warning satellites, as well as other sensor systems throughout their missile warning system. But he was, again, you mentioned General Donnelly being the right man at the right time in the right place at the right time. So was Petrov. And he was called into duty that night because the regular watch officer was sick. And so Petrov was there when these alarms started coming in shortly after midnight that there were several waves of ICBM launches coming out of Grand Forks Air Force Base, North Dakota. And so he had to deal with that and try to make sense of it within just a course of a few minutes and decide whether to tell his leadership that there was reason to, you know, get ready for a retaliatory strike or not. So he, he was talk about being put on the hot seat. He, <laughs> <laughs> he had a decision to make that was really beyond the comprehension of most humans. Oh yeah. Most, most important decision of all time in, in some sense, I think. I think that's right. And, and one thing I think to reckon with is that the nuclear arsenals of the United States and the Soviet Union in 1983 were gigantic and extremely capable compared to the nuclear weapons that each side possessed at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So if the Cuban Missile Crisis had resulted in a nuclear conflict, it would have been horrible. And, you know, tens of millions of people probably would have been killed. Mm -hmm. but, but if we'd had one in 1983, it would have been an extinction of that. My gosh, my gosh, we're also lucky to be here. Do you happen to know, Brian, or does anyone know, I should say, what were the specific indicators of this event that he, that, that allowed him to realize that it, it was a false positive? Like what was it? He what did he see on the screen that he said no no, no that that can't be possible. It, there were several things I think that led him to make the assessment he did. One was the context, which was even though he knew we were in this fraught period of tension between the Soviet Union and the United States, he even said that night, and he said in later interviews that he knew the United States if they were going to launch a first strike. The United States would go all in. They wouldn't launch, you know, five ICBMs and then launch three more and then launch a few more, you know, 10 minutes later. And they wouldn't launch just from one Air Force base. There it would be a general nuclear strike. Mm -hmm. And so it the context didn't make sense to him as a military guy. He said, Well, if they're going to attack me, they're going to attack me with everything they've got. So that was number one. Number two, again, he was the expert on the signals from these missile warning satellites, and he knew that they'd been having glitches. They'd been having problems. He, in fact, that very night, he had to do a upload a software fix for one of the satellites in their constellation, one of the missile warning satellites, because it was wobbling in its orbit. So he he was. Uh, keenly aware of the limitations of this satellite constellation. It was the first generation of missile warning satellites the Soviets had, had launched, and they'd only been on orbit for about a year. And in his mind, they weren't really ready for prime time. So he was always, I think, going to be a bit skeptical of indicators of launches coming from these satellite systems. And then he looked for corroboration from other parts of their missile warning system. And he alerted, you know, various and sundry other 
sensor systems and in, even agents in the United States to uh, provide any kind of corroboration that these launches had incurred. And he didn't get any corroboration. So it was a combination, I think, of of all of those factors that led him to make the decision that he made. And he, he had to make it within about 20 minutes. So it wasn't, again, like he had the luxury of time to sit and assess this and ponder <laughs> different scenarios. He had to he had to pretty much make a judgment and go with it. Mm. When you lay it all out in the way that you just did, it, it makes for a very convincing argument that this was not happening. But, you know, factoring that this is what one man is telling all, everybody else is is higher leadership there and they are thinking they're in the last minutes of their lives right now and they have to do something and that that emotional response probably was was extremely powerful when stacked up against the kind of logical reasoning that he that Petrov had but that nobody else was providing either so i can really see what a precarious position they were in and that we were all in as a as a consequence of that yes and and you're right too justin that we were unaware of this incident at the time and were unaware of it until many years later. And just, you know, set your mind back to 1983. If, had we been aware of this incident, it would have shaken our confidence in the ability of the Soviets to manage their nuclear forces. You know, even though one man, you know, stopped a retaliatory strike, it would have, I, I just know it would have shaken confidence that the Soviets were truly on top of things if they could have indicators like this come into their National Missile Defense Center. Oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah, they, they become even more of a wild card than what we were thinking before that. Yes. My gosh. So what happened to Petrov after that? So obviously we know that nuclear war was averted. So did they eventually agree with his conclusion or was it just a matter of the timer running out and there were no explosions? Well, he did make the decision before missile impact would have occurred. And so th his leadership trusted him enough and trusted his judgment. Again, had it been a different watch officer that night who didn't have intimate knowledge of the signals, maybe it would have been a different story. But he had so much credibility that they, you know, went with his judgment and and then his judgment obviously was confirmed. However, unfortunately for Stanislav Petrov, he was made the villain of this episode by the Soviet military hierarchy. He embarrassed a lot of people above him, both not only military people, but especially civilians who had certified that these missile warning satellites were fully operational. And he essentially that night proved they aren't. <laughs> and so uh, he embarrassed a lot of people and his career was destroyed as a result. And he was never promoted again. And he, he retired as a Lieutenant Colonel a few years later. And he went into the Soviet defense industry and had a kind of a mediocre career and he became a very embittered person, had an alcohol problem. He was a real mess for the rest of his life, unfortunately, and he died certainly uncredited in the Soviet Union or and Russia for what he did. He did receive some credit late in life from some organizations in Europe and also from the United Nations, but he died pretty penniless and, and a sad case. It's a tragedy. Oh, yeah, no kidding. What a terrible tragedy. The smartest, calmest guy in the room, and that's his reward because mm. his real crime was embarrassing his superiors, which is about the worst crime you can commit in any bureaucracy, I'm afraid. Yeah, true. Very, very sad, very sad. Yeah, very much <laughs> so. Okay, so, well, that, that takes us up to Abel Archer, then, subject of your book, of course. So, what exactly were the able archer exercises well the able archer was the code name for a nato nuclear exercise that occurred every year and it was the culminating exercise uh, 
in a series of interlocking exercises that start that used to start in September and went through October and into November each fall that fell under the general rubric of reforger. And these these exercises included the movement of conventional forces around Europe, the reinforcement of US forces from the continental US to Europe, we would test our logistics, and we'd fly and send by ship lots of supplies and men from the United States to Europe just to show the Soviets we're, we're serious about defending Europe, we'll, we'll send people from the states. So there was this series of interlocking exercises, which that year, ironically, were a bit more robust than they normally were. And again, culminating with a nuclear exercise. So the scenario for this series of exercises, which began in September, was essentially that conventional war breaks out in Europe. It goes through, it goes up the escalatory ladder with the use of chemical weapons. And then finally, the final stage of escalation is a nuclear conflict. And Abel Archer, specifically again was the nuclear component and the final phase of this lengthy series of exercises yeah. okay i see i see and the soviets were aware well aware of these every year leading up to 1983 weren't they yes yes they were there were several things about able archer 83 that alarmed the kremlin one was that the nato was testing out new command and control protocols because they were anticipating, again, the deployment late in the year of those Pershing II missiles and ground launch cruise missiles. The original scenario for the exercise for Able Archer called for both Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan to participate and for them to participate specifically in, when the National Command Authority was asked for nuclear weapons release. And we believe, we don't know with certainty, but we believe, we believe the Soviets intercepted that exercise syllabus and they knew that Reagan and Thatcher were going to participate. Now, as it happened, the cooler heads in the White House decided maybe that's not such a good idea, <laughs> especially because of the Korean airline shoot down and all of the tension that was resulting from that. So. Reagan and Thatcher did, in fact, not participate in Able Archer. There were other elements of Able Archer 83 deployments that were unusual. I won't say unprecedented, but they didn't happen every year. And that alarmed the Soviets as well. So and, and the other thing to to really keep in mind is they're looking, the Soviets are looking through the prism of the U.S. is planning a nuclear first strike, so what better way to do it than under the camouflage of an exercise? Mm. And the and especially one that's quite realistic, which Able Archer eighty three was. The the further context, which I didn't mention earlier, is that the the Soviet intelligence community, the KGB and the GRU, Soviet military intelligence, had been conducting since May of 1981, the largest intelligence collection operation since World War II. And it went under the title of Operation Ryan. And Ryan, which is an Anglo, it's an English version of a Russian acronym, but the, the acronym stands for nuclear rocket attack. And so th this entire intelligence program was designed to find indications that the United States was going to launch a first strike. And so the whole intel community in the Soviet Union, both the military and the civilian side, were attuned to this and they were reporting on indicators of potential nuclear war and looking for provocations like, you know, hmm, let's say a Korean airliner entering airspace or U.S. Navy aircraft overflying Soviet military facilities or big Navy exercises like we conducted in March of 1983 in the Pacific. So the, the whole mindset 
in the intelligence community and in the Kremlin, and remember the general secretary of the Soviet Union at this time was Yuri Andropov, who had been chairman of the KGB for 16 years. So, and, and Operation Ryan was his baby. He had, he personally initiated this program. So they're looking at everything through that lens. And when they see Able Archer 83, and that it's testing procedures that they haven't seen before. We actually, I talk about this in the Able Archers, we actually change the codes so that of our communications codes. So it would befuddle and make it more difficult for the Russians to collect our communications during Able Archer. And so, you know, one of the classic indicators of a war is that the adversary changes its communications codes mm. you know and so we did sure. all those things and 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 these uh, on drop off and others in the leadership and remember at this time the soviet leadership was elderly all of these men except with a couple of exceptions including mikhail gorbachev who was on the politburo at this time all of these men except for the couple younger ones had experienced world war ii as adults and what the the nightmare scenario for them was operation barbarossa which was the german surprise attack on the soviet union in 1941 and they viewed that the united states is fully capable of launching a nuclear operation barbarossa and they talked about it in those terms. So Able Archer to them looked real. And it it precipitated on the Soviet side a a truly unprecedented s series of nuclear reactions that we had not seen before. We had not seen before in Eastern Europe and in some cases had not been seen before with regard to their strategic nuclear forces. So there was paranoia in the Kremlin and on the U.S. side, there was a, an absence of belief that the Soviets could, uh, could any, in any way believe that we would conduct a nuclear first strike. There, it, it just didn't fit our mental framework. It, and we were mirror imaging the adversary thinking they can't possibly believe that we would attack them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see. So because of that, the, the mirror image, imaging, like you mentioned, was there any consideration like when you were when you were looking at the assessing the exercise and the, the risks associated with the exercise? Was there any consideration given to the possibility that the Soviets might think that this was an actual buildup or a preparations for a first strike? I mean, was that something that was already on your minds before the Soviet activity began to increase? I don't think it entered into the thinking of the exercise planners at all. Oh, wow. And, and, and I've, I've talked to a, a couple of officers who were involved in Able Archer 83 and some of the, a number of whom have read my book, have read the Able Archers and they're just flabbergasted. They, they've told me that they had no idea that the Soviet, they didn't even know the Soviets were reacting the way they were. And and that didn't that doesn't surprise me because of compartmentation in the US and NATO system. In other words, these nuclear guys, these nuclear planners, they wouldn't even be clear to see the intelligence we had on the Soviets. Sure, sure. So, okay. yeah, I mean, it, it, it was truly a case of us kind of blindly proceeding with an exercise, not not comprehending the impression it was making on the other side of the iron curtain okay okay yeah I, I can certainly see that happening and during all of this what was your specific role in the exercise were you you were directly involved in the exercise weren't you no i i was not i was ah. an intelligence officer so i wouldn't have been involved in something like able archer i knew it was going on i was actually by then in washington at the soviet affairs directorate oh. and we were watching what was going on in the Soviet nuclear forces reaction and were becoming increasingly alarmed as to 
the level of alert that they were going on and the unprecedented nature in some cases of that alert. So we were watching it and the guys that were more on the front lines in Germany became the Intel people, I mean, became increasingly alarmed over what they were seeing on the other side of, of the Berlin Wall. Okay. And what was the reaction to all of this in Washington, in the Soviet Affairs Division where you were? I mean, how did you, was there an uh, idea or a strategy for how to counter this Soviet buildup or how to de-escalate the situation somehow? Well, we were in consultation with U.S. Air Forces Europe with the intelligence function in in Europe, but really, and they were relying on us for some analytical help, but they were carrying the water. The guys in, in Germany were really carrying the water. And it was the head of Air Force intelligence in Europe, a, a General Lenny Perutz, who became alarmed at what his people were briefing him. And, and Perutz was a career intelligence officer. He'd spent a fair amount of time in Europe. He, he understood the Soviets quite well. And he knew we'd never seen anything like we were seeing. And it alarmed him. And he briefed his leadership and the NATO leadership. He was asked, what should we do? Should we reciprocate? The Able Archer exercise notwithstanding, should we, no kidding, go on a higher nuclear alert? Should we start loading up F-4s with nuclear bombs and, you know, this sort of thing? And General Perusa's response to his leadership was, no, don't do that. I think it'll only provoke them. Let's just wind this exercise down. Let's not do anything out of the ordinary. And let's just try to reassure them that we're we're just doing an exercise and don't worry about it. And that was his advice and his, his advice was followed. And as it turns out, he was the right man in the right place at the right time too, because wow. he gave the right, he gave the right advice. Although, and I, I worked for General Perutz after his time in Germany, he came to the air staff in the Pentagon and he was my, he was my boss in the Pentagon. And we talked about this and he knew about my role in the Korean airline shoot down and, and all of this. So anyway, but General Perutz was really the, the, the hero of Abel Archer and helping to diffuse that situation. Hmm. That's fantastic. So just, it was just a matter of, I guess, a very tense few days as the exercise went on to its natural conclusion, its scheduled conclusion. I should say, and just hoping yes. that the, or not should say hoping, but watching to see if the Soviets would continue to escalate at that point. Yes. And, and the other thing that was going on in the Soviet Union, which we were watching, was they were undertaking civil defense measures like we hadn't ever seen before, even during the Cuban Missile Crisis. They were, this is in the, during Abel Archer, it was during the first two weeks of November of 1983, Soviet citizens were being drilled in nuclear war preparation and were being told to evacuate their places of work, schools, et cetera, and go to their nuclear bomb shelters. And they were testing the civil defense system in all the major cities. They were there. One member of the Politburo who had the unfortunate name maybe of for a communist of Romanov was the last name. He gave a speech the first week of November that was like an Armageddon speech, nationally televised speech about, we've never seen conditions this bad, prepare yourselves. You know, the it was almost like an end of days speech. Other things that we saw was that the for the first time since World War II, that fall, the Soviet general staff prevented or did not permit, I should say, the Soviet military supporting the annual harvest. During the, the days of the Soviet Union, the military would be mobilized to go out and help with the harvest in Ukraine and southern Russia and other places. And 
they did not do that this year. They were they were retained in garrison, and they were in some cases they were given combat loads and sent out to the field to prepare for war. And I mean, there were all these indicators that were both on the conventional side and the nuclear side that were not good. We saw them uploading nuclear weapons on MiG-27s and SU-24s in Germany, which they had never done before, ever. Mm -hmm. So it, there were lots of things that were cause for alarm, and that's what General Perutz was seeing. Wow, wow. Yeah, it's, it's hard for you to imagine. So were, were, you, were you sitting in these briefings? Were you getting all of this information that you were laying right now? Were you getting it as it was occurring in, in briefings or from your own analysts or, or what have you? Well, bits and pieces, I would say, Justin. It, and and that, that's the case in the intelligence business is you never really have the full picture, certainly not in real time, unless it's a really tactical situation like that EP3 near shoot down I talked about earlier. When you're trying to assess what's happening in a theater of operations, uh, there are so many variables, there's so many unknowns that you're trying to piece things together. You're trying to put a puzzle together and you don't have all the pieces. So that's where we were then, but we knew enough to be alarmed. And I will say, and I just wrote an article about this that appeared this week in the Air and Space Force magazine. I wrote an article about the Air Force role in the 1983 nuclear war crisis that Air Force intelligence was was really on top of this and the rest of the intelligence community frankly was not hmm. and uh, there are exceptions to that but i i certainly cia was downplaying all of this and that's well documented and president reagan in his presidential daily briefings was was not being told that this was going on frankly oh my gosh and, right and you know general Perutz was kind of a voice in the wilderness, you know, mm. saying this is bad and this is, you know, we need to, we need to, we need to take steps to try to de-escalate this situation before it gets completely out of control. And General Perutz, he became director of Defense Intelligence Agency at the end of his career. And when he retired in 1989, he wrote a highly classified report about the 1983 crisis, which then precipitated the White House demanding a reassessment of what happened in 1983. And the president's Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board mandated a study to go back and look at 1983, and it essentially vindicated Perutz and Air Force Intelligence, and it, 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 didn't, it took to task CIA for downplaying the whole episode. So it's kind of, this is sort of famous, this is inside baseball within the intelligence community, but <laughs> you know, it, it, it is a fact that Perutz got it right, thank goodness, and he made the right decision. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. Yeah, this, the whole theme here, of course, has been people making the right decision under a huge amount of pressure and kind of carrying the day, which is, yes. is really fantastic to see. It's a, it's a wonderful, you know, narrative. I, would, I was almost gonna say narrative device, but it's not a device at all. These are real people that, you know, were there in the moment and rose to the occasion. And Justin, that's one of the things I, I, I really tried to highlight in the Able Archers and the importance of individual judgment. In fact, Secretary, former Secretary of Defense Robert Gates wrote an endorsement for the Able Archers, and I include part of it, part of his endorsement on the front cover. And I don't have it in front of me now, but he essentially says that this work of fiction really brings out and highlights the importance of human judgment at times of high stress. So, yeah, and ironically, Bob Gates was, at the time of this incident, he was Deputy Director for Intelligence at CIA, and it was his, his team that was essentially saying, you know, downplaying these events. And he later came to believe that these events were really bad, <laughs> and that we <laughs> we nearly stumbled into a general nuclear war. Wow, wow, what a story! So, so you said that the exercise concluded. How quickly did the Soviets actually kind of understand that this had not been what they had anticipated and start to wind down their own readiness? 
in a way, those are two separate things. I think they they did understand fairly quickly that Abel Archer was probably not going to precipitate a surprise nuclear attack. However, they didn't really stand down. They did stand down to some degree in the forward in East Germany. They took planes off nuclear alert, for example, but they did maintain a heightened nuclear readiness for another six months or so. And yeah. it was only after Yuri Andropov, Andropov died in February of 1984. And it was only after he kind of passed from the scene and the, the wind kind of went out of the sails of Operation Ryan and, and all of that, that they just began to gradually de-escalate their alert status. So, yeah, they did de-escalate, but it took some time. And uh, I, I think one reason that they took time to de-escalate was because if, you know, if you're sitting in their seat, okay, Able Archer 83 is wound down, but now what's happening? Oh, they're deploying ground launch cruise missiles to the United Kingdom. They're deploying the Pershing twos to West Germany. We better not let our guard down <laughs> because <laughs> right. the missiles are actually showing up now. So I think that's, to me, logically, it makes sense that they kept on alert because they were uh, they were seeing the actual deployments now of these weapon systems and and these weapons being bedded down at their bases. Right, right. I can see how that would be a concern. And I guess there's well, I shouldn't say I guess I know that there was always a level of simmering tension throughout the Cold War. That was kind of the central aspect of the entire Cold War. But you know, it's, it's it's hard to imagine a more tense few days than what you just described, especially because the world is, for the most part, totally oblivious to what's going on at that time. Yeah. It's not a really publicized event like in, you know, the Cold Cuban Missile Crisis, for example, with the president giving addresses and, and tracking right. the Soviet ships in real time and all that. So, yeah, it could have all ended in an instant for most of the population of the world in a worst case scenario. Yes, and I think that you're exactly correct. And, and unlike the Cuban Missile Crisis, as, as you just described, this didn't play out in public, with the exception of the Korean Airlines shoot down. Everybody knew about that, but they didn't connect that to other things. And, and I think that speaks to the second point, which is to truly understand the events of 1983, it requires connecting a lot of dots and, and building up kind of an intelligence picture from various puzzle pieces. Mm -hmm. But once you assemble that puzzle, it's pretty alarming and and i'll i'll say just one footnote that i was in a meeting about two months ago now with a very very senior intelligence active u.s intelligence officer who served then he he's still on active duty but he was he was serving in 1983 and i gave him a copy of the able archers and it, we then talked about the events of 1983 for about half an hour one of the things he said to me was you know, we really, really got that wrong. He was at CIA at the time and he said, we got it wrong. And this thing was so bad <laughs> and, you know, and you need to get the story out. He said, Brian, the world needs to know the story. This is, it's more germane to what's going on in Ukraine than the Cuban Missile Crisis is. This is more like the attributes of the 1983 crisis really are closer to what we're dealing with today and the lack of communication between us and the Kremlin, et cetera, et cetera. So he was very forceful in saying, you just try to get this out there and get as many people, especially in Washington, D.C., to understand what actually happened. Mm, great. Yeah, that's a, that's a real ringing endorsement for your writing this series. So, Brian, obviously, as we've said several times, you know, you've you fictionalized this story for your book, but you did also mention that you've got several other books coming up. So do they continue with Able Archer 83 or do you move on to another subject after you've written about this one in the first book? Well, I'll preface that answer by saying that the way I wrote the Able Archers and the way I've written all of these books is first person narration. Of, but I have two and this is an unusual literary device, but I have two first person narrators. And one is an American intelligence officer who's based on me. And the other is a 
more seasoned and older Soviet military intelligence GRU colonel who's based on GRU and KGB officers I knew back in the 80s. So the two of them share their perspectives. So you see, in many cases, the same events through, but through different lenses, through the American lens and through the Russian lens and, and so on. So that's how I've written it. Now, to answer your, your, not only the Able Archers, but all the books, and to answer your question, book number two begins just a few months after the Able Archers ends. And it begins in Germany, the Soviets still being on heightened nuclear alert and NATO in some ways, not really quite sure what the hell they're up to. <laughs> and my character is given a mission to go into East Germany and try to help determine what's going on. So that's how it kicks off. And part one of, of the second book, which is called The Righteous Arrows, is based in largely in Germany. It's in East and West Germany. But the rest of the book, The Righteous Arrows, parts two and three, take place in Afghanistan and Pakistan during 1986, which was the high point or low point, depending on your point of view, of the Soviet war in Afghanistan. Uh, and my characters in each of these books and all of the books, my American character and the Russian character come together in act three of each mm. of the, they, they actually meet and have some meaningful interaction in part three of, of each of the books. So in the Able Archers, they come together to help try to diffuse under the direction, my characters under the direction of General Perut, so I use a slightly different name for in the in the book. Anyway, so that's that's how it plays out. And then the remainder of the series, the rest of the books follow Captain Katani, who is the character based on me, and Colonel Levchenko, the Russian character. They the books follow them through their careers and through different world events and but the, the format of each book is, is similar in three parts or three acts, and they come together in act three in each, each case. Great. That, that's a fantastic way to, to frame all of this because it's a, to me, it seems, having not read, you know, two, three, and four yet, of course, but it seems like a great way to dive into these other, you know, almost episodes, I would say, of the Cold War and really see it from both sides. I, is that what you're trying to do with it? Show the Soviet perspective on events and the American perspective as well? Yes, yes. And I wanted to humanize the Soviets too. And, and I do that largely through Colonel Levchenko, who gets promoted and spoiler alert is, you know, a general officer later. But yeah, I wanted to humanize these people. And, and Levchenko's character is married. He, Levchenko is married to a Ukrainian woman. And so there's this Ukrainian Russian tension <laughs> that runs <laughs> through the books. And it's, you know, it's fun. And they're, and, the and and readers of the Able Archers, I, I wanted people to identify with these characters, and and the books are really character driven, and people do, and people, a lot of readers of the Able Archers have been bugging me about when's book two coming out because I want to know what happens to Captain Katani next or Colonel Levchenko next. So it's 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 fun. Wow, yeah, that that sounds perfect. Honestly, I think that's exactly the sort of thing that my my readers and my listeners would absolutely enjoy. So I'm definitely going to include some links to your stuff after this. And are these books already kind of getting a lot of attention? It certainly sounds like it from what I've I've seen of your work online. Well, the Able Archers, yes, it's the only one that's published yet. I'm hoping to get book number two published maybe in a year or so. And uh, the Able Archers has been picked up by Legendary Entertainment, which is one of the largest movie and TV production companies in the world. And so they've optioned it either to make a motion picture or more likely a TV series from it. So we're excited about that. Oh my gosh. And Blackstone Publishing, which is a very large publisher of audiobooks, just brought out the audiobook version of The Able Archers a couple of weeks ago. So that's available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. I encourage them to hire two different readers, right? One for the American and one for the Russian. And they did. I'm, I'm very pleased. Oh, good, good. 
that they did so and the and they're both actors from new york city and the one who reads Levchenko is russian and so it's it's good it's fun that, that's terrific that sounds great and you know if this does become a series you know in the next few years i mean we could always honestly use more cold war television series i can't get enough of those myself and i think that a lot of my readers and listeners are the same way so i'm i'm very excited about that possibility yeah we are too and i i think you know and many people have said that it really lends itself to that kind of theatrical presentation and and i think it does i i think it would make a really great series especially because then you could develop the characters out a bit more okay yeah absolutely fantastic I'll, I'll definitely keep an eye out for that series and i'm looking forward to the next book next year as well so you don't have a, a publication date for that one yet but that's what you're you're aiming for at the moment is that right yes yeah my literary agent has has the manuscript and he's meticulously putting a marketing plan together gotcha. fantastic <laughs> so. fantastic okay so in the meantime brian do you have like a website or public social media pages that you can share for anybody who wants to connect with you and kind of follow along on updates on the on the series or on the um you know television or, or movie deals yes probably the best way is through my website which is www.brian b-r-i-a-n j mora m-o-r-r-a dot com so brianjmora.com yeah we keep that we were just updating that website today with my webmaster and that's the best place probably for the latest we in fact today we just posted i referenced this article that i just published in air and space forces magazine we just posted the link to that today on on the website i do have a facebook page as well and we do keep that updated and i do a newsletter also i try not to bury people with stuff, but but I write a, a newsletter once a month and folks can sign up for that newsletter on my website. And that that's where I really include like the, what's the latest from legendary entertainment, what's the latest on what's happening with, with the next books and, and that kind of thing. So good. And good, of good. course and of course you know we'll we'd love to post a link to this this episode on our web page as well. Oh, yeah, certainly. It'll it'll be out soon, so we'll send you a link as soon as it's published. That's no problem. They do come out every Monday. And um I'm, you know, I'm really glad to hear honestly that you provide updates on the on the movie and the book series because a lot of authors I found in the past, you know, they're fairly guarded about that kind of thing. And I don't know if it's because they have to be contractually or they just don't want to, you know, set expectations that they're mm -hmm. not necessarily able to meet later on, but if if like you said you've already written the first four, I mean, it sounds like you really got a lot done before you kind of went public with these books. Yeah. So that's, that's a great sign, honestly. Yes. And yeah, they're, I, I think the, the books are, are going to be a lot of fun for people to read. I, I, and again, people kind of get invested in the main characters in through the able archers and, and want to know what happens to them. And I do too. That's one of the, the joys of writing these books in the series is I get to figure out what happens to these guys next. And they usually, <laughs> they usually tell me, I, I don't tell them. <laughs> oh, I uh, know. Yeah. The books kind of write themselves in a way you just have to hold the pen or, or a type yeah. uh, fingers on the keys. Yeah. It's, uh, certainly, certainly some chapters do flow that way for sure. Good, good, good. Well, Brian, this has been wonderful. I really appreciate your time and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the next book in the series and the eventual television or movie series as well. Thank you so much for your time tonight. I appreciate it. Well, you're very welcome, and thank you very much, Justin. It's been a real pleasure. Great. All right. Well, take care, Brian. Thank you. Don't forget to download a free sample of The Able Archers by Brian Mora using the link in the show notes of this episode. And you can also order The Able Archers right now from Amazon or Barnes & Noble. That's bn.com. And if you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my pages on Instagram at Spycraft 101 and at cold.war.stamps. You can also find more great articles on my website, spycraft101.com. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there is lots more to come. Disclaimer. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The stories and statements expressed herein are experiences and opinions. They may not reflect the views of the host or the production studio. It's okay if you disagree with our content. No piece of media is right for everyone.
If you love Spycraft 101, please check us out online, on Instagram, on YouTube, and especially on Patreon. Thank you for listening.